Hello, and welcome to today's episode of the Scurf Interviews podcast. Uh, we're still in our first mini series exploring the intersection of culture and incentives. And I'm very excited for today's conversation where we're going to be digging a little more into culture and specifically onboarding as well and uh, what the intersection of those two topics looks like. To begin, I'll ask our guests to introduce themselves and then we'll jump right into the conversation. So, Livia, do you mind kicking off the intros? Yeah, thank you, Eugene. I'm Livia. So I'm part of the Common Stack team, uh, where I uh, go mostly for the cultural build, where we've been implementing this process in the TEC, the Token Engineering Commons. And uh, there I lead the SAFGov and Culture Working Group, where we've been implementing the Ostrom's principles into our culture. And um, I've been also um, in the research group of DAO reward systems with the Token Engineering Academy and governance. Great. Thank you, Livia. Seth, do you mind jumping in? Uh, hi there, all. Uh, my name is Seth Fry. I'm a professor of communication at University of California, Davis. Uh, my training is cognitive science and computational social science. And uh, where my career has taken me is um, uh, after some experiences of you know really powerful self-governance, people coming together, in the uh, analog space of, of um, cooperatives such as housing cooperatives, I got more and more interested in the science of the commons, the science of self-governance, the science of people, you know, building stuff together uh, beyond, you know, um, lab experiments showing that cooperation exists. Uh, there's a lot about institutional structure um, uh, for today, you know, culture, uh, norms, processes, and, and, and trust. The people build surprisingly complex institutions for themselves to, to build meaning and build stuff and share resources together. And I study all that. I use a data science perspective, um, focusing on online communities, both because online is a place people are going to build meaning and because they're very amenable to data science and uniquely positioned to push the sort of large scale comparative uh, institutional analysis the large scale study of um, successful self-governance to a new level. And uh, that's, uh, that's my connection uh, to this all and to you all. Perfect. Well, thank you both for joining. And I kind of want to start with a, a very high level question. So feel free to take it in the direction that feels most comfortable. But I want to start off with a question of what role does culture play in communities in general, whether we're talking Web3 specific or, or more broadly? I like to define culture as the tension between tradition and innovation. And I feel like both are so important and having awareness of which elements compose the foundation of a community and what type of uh, expanding movements are happening is really important for monitoring and addressing ecosystem health. So just understanding where the community wants to move towards and what sets the foundation for the community. And maybe that is the role culture plays, having like awareness of all the elements that play in a certain ecosystem. Uh, for, for me, so I'm approaching all of this from a lens of the work of a woman named Eleanor Ostrom, uh, so the first woman who won the Nobel Prize in Economics for her work on the tragedy of the commons and how communities sustainably manage commonful resources. So when I'm looking at a, a community, I'm looking very much from the lens of what are their resources and sort of orienting my entire understanding of what they're up to and why they do what they do around the fact of limited resources uh, and the, the trust or the rules or the processes or enforcement or monitoring that's necessary to ensure the kind of sustainable access and sharing and extraction. Um, of those resources and, and building of those resources. So for me, where culture fits in is an understanding that those sort of governance outcomes and resource management outcomes. Uh, you can make a distinction um, out of Ostrom uh, world um, uh, between you know rules and form, which is your formal structure and rules and use, which is gonna be your kind of more general thing, uh, including culture, which I define as all the stuff um, that predicts how the organization uh, is going to turn out. That's not uh, that's internalized by the members. Um, so this can be internalized values, internalized mental models, internalized behaviors, 
Um, all the stuff that doesn't necessarily need rules um, in order to be counted on because people are representing it inside themselves. And um, so the role that culture plays then is reducing how much you're leaning on written rules. Um, and some of those contextualizing rules, you know, uh, uh, these rules, uh, some set of rules might only make sense or might only be effective um, in the context of a group of people who have internalized the values that they kind of uh, maybe rely on or depend on, internalize the prerequisites those rules need to be effective. And so um, for me, culture plays a little bit of the role of the secret sauce. How do we articulate it to uh, maybe more explicitly or pull out or name that context so that we know all the ingredients that are leading to institutional success beyond just what I, the, the text I can scrape of, of written rules. I like the secret sauce. <laughs> and that, that makes me think a little bit about sort of a, say, the chicken and the egg problem with humans and culture. Sort of a, do the humans bring, are, are they the ones setting a culture into an environment? Or is it at that intersection of the humans and the resources? Because I know prior to thinking about this more deeply, things like resources or, or asset mapping or community mapping, those things would seem very different than whatever the this flowery thing that culture might be that that's hard to put a finger on. But it's so interesting that both of you kind of came in from the angle of the awareness of what's in the ecosystem or the specific resources. Yeah, I guess when thinking or, you know, starting up a new community, how much is it that like, hey, I'm starting this, I'm inherently creating a culture or is it is culture fundamentally in the context of a constrained environment where there are limited resources and time? Uh, well, for, for my view, because you catch that very much in resource, so I'll, I'll, I'll take the lead. Um, I think you get a lot for free from the context. If uh, You get a lot of culture for free if there's a group of people who um, really need the resource to exist, whose livelihoods really depend on it, or whose ideologies or values are really aligned with um, what the group's trying to accomplish. You just kind of get a lot of that for free. And if you're working for something where there's that self-motivation in place for the thing uh, to succeed, then people go really far uh, and, and you're already getting that internalized values kind of uh, off the bat, um, which already, which just goes a long way. If, uh, if you're more of a, I don't know, if we're talking the day job scenario, if we're talking like a, a minor thing governing like sharing of cat memes rather than your livelihood, uh, then I could see um, um, a people, you know, maybe just being more satisfied with written rules and having to lean less on culture. Uh, um, and also people who, to the extent that you want culture, maybe having to take a more active role in building it and getting intentional about it. Uh, from your organization's leadership or from um, any kind of intentional community level understanding that we're going to have to work on this if we're going to um, have a large internalized uh, component uh, of how we work as a group. Yeah, I think this question is especially interesting um, now in, in the crypto space or the DAO space where it has been very intentional, like the coming together of those communities, and especially when people come from all sorts of backgrounds and there is this intersection point where there's like a, a bubbling pot of so many ingredients that people bring with themselves already. But then uh, there's this process of understanding what is the shared mission of that group and I think if this process is brought in as an intentional um, collaborative process where people can understand together what they're doing there, what is their mission, what are their values, what are they agreeing on, then um, it creates a ground for another level of culture to be built based on what each individual brings. And of course, they have their own culture, but... Um, having a shared path or a shared understanding of where you're going brings this to a different level of like co-creating culture, not only from the things that you have inherently, but the things that you want to develop together. That's really cool. Um, one thing that's just been a great pleasure about meeting common stack people in particular, smart contract research forum people in particular, has been that, that culture is a no-brainer. Um, and I, get, I mean, that sounds obvious, right? Uh, except 
that the whole ideology of the crypto space is we can have computational trust that we don't have to build um, human person to person trust. We can have computational you know alignment, right? Mechanism driven decentralized alignment that we don't need to like have conversations to reach alignment. Uh, and that is like a um, an attitude, like a hope or a dream or a vision that drives a lot of, of work and, and arguably a lot of innovation in the crypto space generally, um, which, you know, uh, get us you, who, people who believe that should get as far as they can with that. And I want to see how far they get with that. But but uh, for me, it's really energizing rather to hear people who. Um, uh, are using the power of crypto maybe more pragmatically or selectively or narrowly or more complementarily um, uh, uh, to complement a lot of this human side stuff. Um, uh, and in that, let's see. I mean, a traditional approach to organizations says like we have all these processes. They take a certain amount of work to maintain. We have all this soft, fluffy culture stuff that takes a certain amount of work, effort, intentionality to maintain. Um, when you move into a more DAO kind of direction, the, the organization stuff takes less to maintain. You've, you've, you've mechanized a lot of it and, and uh, uh, algorithmified a lot of it. Uh, but the, the culture stuff you know, is just as hard as it was the first day. Uh, given that, I do see an opportunity in the DAO space for maybe precisely because your, your organization side takes a little bit effort, a little bit less effort to keep up. It almost gives us an opportunity to really hone in and bring attention um, to, to culture in a new way because it's just so much more obviously um, that secret sauce, that, that thing that we'll call it free capacity. Uh, if, we, if we can build within groups um, uh, the, the dimensions of internalization that are valuable, uh, we have uh, a bunch of capacity for free in terms of not having to add institutional or formal structure uh, and get more um, for everybody out of the group. Absolutely. Yeah, I think if anything, um, the tech and the algorithmic uh, algorithms should just help people to be more connected to each other and to have more points of trust and to have more contact and to building this organisms that are not like i think when we're talking about DAOs, especially or my vision at least is that it goes a little bit beyond organizations and it gets this like organic organism form of like the it's like a membrane for you to get in and people join and people move in and out in a more like fluid type of movement rather than um I don't know, more structured processes that usually exist in traditional organizations. And I think to your point of, well, we have all of these tools and we're focusing so much on them. I think even for algorithmic policies, for example, or algorithmic aided governance, still the data being captured by um by these tools is data that comes from people, that comes from behavior, that comes from um, the relationships that are happening in the space. And if there's not like a clear feedback loop of like, okay, this data is getting into the system, then we have a simulation, then we have these algorithms that will give directions for how people should behave or for how decisions should be made. And if if this circle is not happening in a way that um, advances the purpose of the organization, then it needs to be reassessed. So this look into the culture and into the people always needs to be happening, no matter how many tools we have to assist that process. Yeah, and I would be interested in getting both of your perspective on the question of sort of the link between commitment to culture and the health of that culture. And, you know, in the crypto space, I'm thinking of the, the rage quit model and the fact that, like, once you just get frustrated, it's like, man, I've had enough of this. Let me just go elsewhere and hang out. And how does that change it? And Seth, to think of some of the work that, that you've uh, done with uh, with Nathan Schneider, if I'm remembering correctly, correctly around effective voice and exit, uh, just kind of taking those two perspectives just from your different worlds around, yeah, how, what tensions arise if I know it's easier or harder for me to leave an environment 
does that actually help? Do elements of that uh, consistently help culture or hurt it in some kind of way? Uh, so in addition to, yeah, my, my theory work, uh, we have an exit invoice uh, a paper, me and Nathan Schneider. Uh, there is some data work with my student, uh, um, uh, Chen Quan Zhang, and the two of us looked at Minecraft. So Minecraft has a property of a lot of online organizations that you can just leave. There's thousands of community-run servers out there, and if you don't like one of them, you can go to another. We, you know, we had... Um, 50 million uh, entry and exit events from 10 million people over um, a couple hundred thousand servers, we're able to drill down and ask, okay, um, you just had this trajectory through all these servers. And they had all these different governance styles, which we're able to scrape by looking at the, uh, scraping the governance plugins that these servers had installed. You know, did you install social hierarchy, private property rights? Um, did you install punishment? Did you prevent bad behavior or, man or install tools that help you manage it, roll it back afterwards, you know, vandalism and such? Uh, and so then the question is, um, you know, we're, we're treating culture a lot as both the, an, out, uh, an, an output, the thing that got built as a result of effort, and an input, a thing that led to increased organizational effectiveness. And, uh, and so let's try to piece those apart. What was, what was stronger? What was a bigger effect on... Um, a community's uh, level of success, say? Was it that people saw this culture in place, this governance system in place, and selected into it? Or uh, was it that, uh, you know, hundreds of people were in a community, but the only ones who stayed, who didn't rage quit, um, were the ones who were most in line with how it was? So is it, uh, so what's the bigger effect? Um, is it the governance system on who selects into it? Or is it the people who select into a community eventually changing and morphing the governance system to match their own values and alignment? Uh, and we're able to show, um, it looks like an order of magnitude, stronger effect on the first one. So, um, that, that the governance system does have an effect, a strong, seems to have a stronger effect on the people than the people self-selecting in. Now, this is just one study. Um, it's one very specific domain, right? Minecraft is not all uh, online online organizations, but uh, A, it illustrates a little bit of the power of data science um, to advance these questions in a way that meat space organizations just um, always had to kind of take it on faith or, or, or you know, go by their gut. Um, and it reflects a little bit um, the, the power of your, of your governance system um, and the unique and the uniqueness of online communities that exit is such an option, it ends up being an additional tool in the toolkit uh, um, for people who are building uh, meaning collectively in the online context. Yeah, that is super interesting, especially having um, you probably don't have so much the identity of the players, right? Yeah. We we have we have some we have a UID that we know it was the same person who went from here to there to there. But right, we, we know nothing about the actual human being behind it. Is it some uh, very proficient thirteen year old? Uh, it, <laughs> is it is it a group of of dads? You know, we, we don't really have this story yet. Overall demographics or median age of Minecraft is like probably twenty ish now. Um, but beyond that, you're right. It's a it's a mystery. All we see are these trends. Yeah, so Olivia, so I was just wondering in terms of uh, with that intersection of uh, trying to think about uh, commitment to culture and the health of it from what you've actually been seeing in different DAOs, whether it's, uh, you know, TEC related activities or just uh, out in the wild, so to say. But are there the elements where uh, I know Moloch DAO is probably an example where rage quitting helped build a very specific culture and created a very specific environment versus other areas. And as Seth was kind of alluding to our environments where it's like, well, we're the only one One's left, so we clearly care about this kind of distilled culture. Yeah, just kind of what, what else have you been seeing from just the examples with different DAOs um, uh, and how that intersection plays out? Yeah, I think offboarding is so important as onboarding, right? Like the people need to understand that that they won't be harmed with the exit. Also, I think sometimes there is a um, um, a lack of care when someone is leaving the process rather than when someone is entering. And in the TEC, we, we developed this offboarding ceremony for the stewards. That is just to acknowledge all the work they've done. And, and we, we give them an NFT of like, of like awesome participation. And, 
just like have a session that everyone can share whatever they want to them that other stewards can appreciate that work. And we had a session in SoftGov once to kind of bring this concept of death and how we usually have a very hard time talking about death and and how to and, and that is such a human aspect and it's such a part of our culture too. So um, do we have do we experience some type of grief feelings? Griefing feelings that I'm saying? Um, or I don't know, what are the emotions uh, related to the the exit of someone in the community? So that has been an interesting path we've been taking there. Yeah, it's really interesting to think of the kind of specific actions and rituals uh, that can help embed culture. And I guess is there, uh, from either perspective, just in terms of working with Dowser or from more uh, research perspective or any other angle, have you seen any kind of particular I already imagine the answer is going to be, it depends. But are, are there any kind of specific kind of rituals that correlate to culture building? Or is it all just depend on the nature of the culture that you're building? Which I feel like is a bit of a... Um, oh, yeah. So welcome to research. <laughs> it depends. Um, well, I, I might be able to say something kind of general. Not exactly from the research. This this is probably just more from like being a person in the world associated with organizations. But... Um, there, there is like a, a toolkit, right? Uh, there's exercises you can do in organizational building. You can um, uh, have really intentional onboarding. You can have a lot of circle ups. You can just like be intentional about talking about it a lot. You can, it's sort of a metacultural thing of talking about culture. Uh, you can, yeah, offboarding is really cool. Ritual is really great and has deep roots in like a lot of human interaction. Um, and then the more those two, we can imagine there's culture space, which is the space of all possible cultures. And the more tools you're using, the more of that space is available to you. So if you're just leaning on one tool, let's say exit, you know, take it or leave it. If you don't like it, um, you know, you just go somewhere else. You won't get hurt. There's a lot of other options. I, I, I'd probably argue that um, you're restricted to a pretty small part, a subset of culture space. Um, uh, uh, but then the more you add, let's say other things, more intentional practices, the more you invest just day-to-day -day resources in, in caring where people are at, um, the more of, of uh, the potential space of possible cultures opens up to you, um, uh, possibly even, uh, um, you know, loaded, uh, uh, things like healthy culture, stronger culture. Yeah. And I think also there is, a. um, um a natural movement that when something ends, there is space for something else to emerge and just keeping track of these movements on how like rituals are probably wanting to maintain some sort of practice or they are grounding people in an experience. They are providing a sense of belonging. But then what is the opposite of that? Like what is that rituals uh, block somehow. Maybe there is some openness or there is something that wants to disrupt a certain pattern that might not be healthy that needs to come from another angle. And then whenever there is a ritual for something that is ending, what is the space that is being opened for um, something innovative to come in or maybe for another type of practice or for another type of questioning or for other people to bring other uh, perspectives as well. Actually, Livia, can I ask a little bit? Um, so I, my, I have a sense of where my knowledge about this kind of thing comes from, right? There's structured observation and data and all these analyses. And then, you know, I have done activism and organizing. But to be honest, I think... Most of my knowledge, most of my knowledge from that route, from experience in like the practitioner side of how to build strong, healthy cultures, comes more from oh wow, I messed that one up. That's a lesson learned. <laughs> I wouldn't say I've, I've, I've been doing it for quite long enough or quite with enough of a knack um, that my experience to to have seen just the knowledge I have from experience lead to great outcomes. Um, and, and so, but yeah, I'd love to hear since um, you know this is your job. Um, where your sense of your knowledge comes from about the effectiveness of culture building? 
Well, I've, I've been an actress for most of my life since I was 11. And I think that gave me um, first tools to learn about myself as like my body is my um, tool, my, my work tool. And I think also as having like collectives trying to build something together. So I, I did, my background is mostly in theater and then performance art and, and cinema also. But, but theater, I think, is the bulk of this like art of coming together and creating something. And there is a lot of conflict, but you need to manage that somehow. And then sometimes there are structures where there is a very clear hierarchy with a director that has all the power. Sometimes it's a more collaborative process where people are just coming with their own creations and that needs to be merged into a final piece somehow. And I think both the structures have different um, burdens and benefits. And I particularly appreciate more of the less hierarchical structure because I think it's more creative, the solutions that come up when people need to figure something out and just having that space for allowing individual creativity. So I try to bring a lot of this into the spaces I'm in now because I think there's a lot of similarities, but I'm definitely learning so much day by day with all of the things that don't go so right or um, yeah, that we need to improvise. Yeah, and in general, in the long run, I wonder how much, how many of these learnings can be naturally deduced without the failure cases, and uh, how much do we need to for everything to go horribly wrong for us to understand? Right. So we know what we don't do now, and then start building something new that hopefully is a little, a little better. Have either one of you seen examples where it is more natural deduction, where it's like we can come up with a culture best practice without ever seeing the failure case? I, I feel like that that's that's a much more challenging one. Unless you somehow have data on every culture ever, which I don't think exists yet. I mean, in, in my view, the closest you can get to that. Um, yeah, I'm, I love science. Um, I think it's the best way to build knowledge systematically. Um, but it's only as good as the thing you're studying. Like, it, it only, it's only as useful as, as much as the thing you're studying is amenable to that approach. And so... I'm a little wary of like general um, uh, prescriptions or practices or, 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 or what happened over there informing what we should do today um, when it comes to, to culture building in particular is a really great uh, domain. Um, the best we can do in terms of learning and learning with a minimum of mistakes, I think is learning with lots of small mistakes in daily practice. So um having like fast, small, tiny, constant iteration and reflection um, in your own organization and as daily practices uh, uh, see, and with, with a lot of um, feeling of the room and a lot of what you might call emotional intelligence um, uh, is going to be the way to kind of uh, systematically build something that, that makes sense for your organization, your culture. Uh, um, uh, uh, with, without really costing mistakes. Um, I do have some intuition about that coming properly from data. We've got some preliminary work going on. Very exciting. Um, we, we just put people in a little uh, experimental laboratory virtual world. And we um, uh, there's four rules that uh, it, it, it's a cooperation game. And so you can fail at the game uh, or you can succeed at the game. And everyone makes more money um, if you trust each other a little bit, put in the work. Everyone else does as well, and, and everyone just gets more out than um, if you're straight up selfish. Um, to encourage cooperative outcomes, because the baseline with no rules, it's a lot of failure. To encourage cooperative outcomes, we created four rules, and they're all kind of orthogonal to each other. So what we're able to do is put hundreds of people in all 16 combinations of those four rules. So you people will have no rules. You people will have rules one and three. You people are going to have rules one, two, and four. And this isn't culture, this is written rules, but for written rules, the effectiveness, how good rule one is at increasing um, organization, I'm sorry, at improving outcomes, um, depends so much on the other rules. So there's, so 
incrementalism in, ter in terms of any kind of general insight of how these should combine is completely out the window. And a lot of building an effect effective outcomes becomes empirical. For our current context, for the rules we inherited and the context we inherited, um, general insights about whether this rule works or not, they might kind of help, but the best way to really know is just to do it and see what happened and then try again and try again and try again, slowly building something. Because you have so many unexpected interactions between rules uh, in the outcomes for a specific context, uh, it, it, um, it, if, if context really, if we're in a domain where context is king, where the effectiveness of some intervention just 100% depends on, on where you're trying to implement it, uh, then it, it becomes a case where culture building is like empirical, personal, contextualized first. And there's good news and bad news there. The bad news is um, systematic, general, broad um, observation. And like, you're not, maybe you're not going to get like a list of, of rules. Maybe you'll just get a list of best practices, which are like suggestions that you should be expected to defy. The good news is um, there is a process you can go through. You can evolve your own, um, and and um, and that means you're the expert. Um, yeah, the good news is you're the expert. You're the you're the person in the world uh, um, with the most expertise for for building your organization the way you want it to be, and, and for aligning the people in your organization the way they ought to be. I'm curious. In that experiment, was that um... Was that a point of observation if the fact that people understood a lot the rules or understood why those rules affected the way they were complying to them or they way, the way they were participating in the game? Or there was um, no curiosity from participants and just a general acceptance of the rules? Um, we, we don't, we don't get access to curiosity or not, but people did experience all the rules for a bit of time. So you get to play the game several times before you kind of get a, a sense of it. And that's, uh, that, um, uh, is really important how, what their experience of was the rule, which in turn depends like, wait, was this rule implemented at like a lull of cooperation in this little mini society? Or was this rule implemented at a high point of cooperation in this mini society? How effective the rule is depends on like where you started. There's all this sensitivity to initial conditions. It's just kind of a mess. But if we're in it to the extent we're in a domain where everything affects everything, affects everything the complexity of the scientific model uh, is just going to be too high for that to be the place that you learn from. And uh, we're going to be in a domain that really respects direct experience messing around and direct uh, uh, you know, someone like you who's, who's just been doing it for a long time rather than someone like me uh, building systems from the outside. Now, I think there are dimensions, there are questions in this where, yeah, everything makes everything, but some things affect everything more than others. Uh, and in those domains, it's going to be maybe where I'm a little bit less useless, right? Where, where it makes sense to bring me in, uh, where, where just some kind of general framework or general claims or outcomes or findings uh, could be a good starting point to someone who wants to be intentional about building a strong culture in their organization. And I guess when thinking about the question of... Uh, of building culture, but specifically taking it from more of the onboarding angle as opposed to building a new organization angle, right? Because there's there's an entity that exists; it already has some kind of culture. I know that, uh, and uh, I, I wonder, Livy, if this resonates with your general Web three experiences as well. But I feel like, unfortunately, more times than not, you discover something exists, then around that already is some error or vagueness of some culture. You know, you get whispers of a culture in the air. Then you actually go try to interact with things, and you're like, hold on, I have to. Spend been 40 hours to catch up to what's going on here i don't have that i have a full-time job i have hobbies like I, how am i supposed to do that so it's it's in, and now on the flip side of nowhere at scurf we're intentionally thinking of how do we set the tone of our culture and how do we embed that as early as process as early as possible in the onboarding process i wonder for both of you just i, I guess how much is it begin yeah how much at what point in the onboarding journey is it the right time to start taking the cultural angle? Or is that a fundamentally wrong question? Because no matter how you structure your onboarding, it's already telling whoever's going through it something about your culture. 
I think, um, yeah, I think onboarding is some type of curation process, right? You, you have so much information and um, most of these communities have um, transparency as a value. So there, there is a lot as soon as you enter and the space moves so fast that you need some type of guidance from someone that is already immersed in that universe to tell you like, if you start here, uh, you're going to find your way and I'll take you by the hand through the steps so you can feel welcome and that you belong and then slowly build that agency that I think it's the most important part of like being in a, in a self governing community. And I think the culture needs to be introduced uh, very early and just the way that people interact with you is already part of that. Like if they're welcoming, that's probably part of their values. If you feel belonging, if you feel like you have access to things that you're interested in, if people are interested about you, like how do you want to be uh, treated? Uh, what are you interested in? And I think especially the mission, vision, and values need to be shared from the beginning because the person enters and understand where where they're going. And if they don't like where that's going, they should know like as soon as possible. And if they like where that's going, they should know how to get aligned with that as soon as possible as well. And I guess on that side, how much of it has been in terms of that needs to come through human to human interaction of the only way I'm going to get that message across is, you know, if I get into a meeting with you and you tell me that as me being the new person to an ecosystem or is that truly a multimodal message that you could send? Are there, you know, uh, documentation or videos or whatnot or whatever that can actually help reinforce culture and not just provide process clarity? Yeah, sure. I think we've been using a lot of uh, Discord and it's, it's great to build bots and you can um, design experiences in many types of ways. And I think that's why a lot of uh, DAO communities have been loving using Discord, but I think there's also a level of human to human interaction that it's very important just for people to feel it's hard to feel welcome with a bot. And it's hard to feel like you belong if you don't have no one to talk to. And it's also not fun, I think. And I think fun, it's, a import, it's an important part of joining a community. Like you want some type of joy from being around people. And yeah, at least in the TC, we've been experiencing um, the vibes of the community as being one of the main reasons why people join and stick around. Maybe it's valuable to get a couple obvious things uh, or, or more kind of clear cut things out of the way before getting into the, the, the meat. Um, you can't have onboarding in the culture until there's culture, you know? So, so culture is like a very bottom up process that for a leader is really more observational uh, than directed, right? It's something that ha it could be, you know, in many cases is ideally something that happened to the leadership or the organization rather than something it, it, um, it, it built in any kind of goal directed way. So it's obviously going to only be after that, that is meaningful to incorporate culture into, into onboarding. Um, uh, the need for culture and onboarding, I think there's evidence for both these things. I'm going to say certainly the first, um, the need for is lower. If you're a low turnover organization, if, if you're ending with the same people you started with, then well, you know, <laughs> literally no onboarding uh, to the extent you have a very open fluid membership, um, but it probably becomes more important. And to the extent that you have, if you have a, a really smooth on ramp into the community where, Oh, well I, you know, I lurked for three years before joining up, then there's less need for onboarding. So those are kind of more clear cut things that probably transfer, right? They're probably generally more, more or less true. Um, for me, that question of onboarding is really interesting. It, it, it's a kind of open question in my head. I think I know the answer, but I don't want, I, I, I don't, I don't, I don't want, I don't like that answer. Um, the possibilities are that, okay, so there's a lot of bad cultures out there and there's a lot of unintentional cultures. Um, so there's going to be two reasons for that. Either culture building is really complex is really suited to people who have this certain vibe, sense, 
that they're able, that they have the spatial capability they were born with, or maybe they acquired through lots of mistakes. Um, and it's a specialization you have to learn because it's complicated. The other possibility is, is rare. Uh, um, good culture, good, healthy cultures are rare because culture building is a lot of work. It's super obvious. Um, you just have to put in the work and do the stuff and then it'll happen. Um, onboarding to me seems, I actually don't know what's the good news and what's the bad news. Um, if one of the, if one of those is true, my gut is telling me and what I'm learning as I talk to culture builders uh, through, through interviews and informally and obviously through making my mistakes, um, is I think it's just a lot of work. Um, uh, the good news being that an organization just has to be intentional about fostering and encouraging it by hiring people like Livia. Yeah, I don't know. Actually, I, what, what do you think, Livia? Well, I think, um, you just said that it's very obvious, right? Like that culture is very obvious. I don't think it is. I think that is the main problem of like, we, we are coming from such a wounded society that a lot of things that should be very basic for how we interact with one another seem not to be. And I think people have, including myself, many walls sometimes to um, interact with others or to feel vulnerable and to build meaningful connections that that those connections will produce the value for what an economy might be about. And, and that culture is the base for, um, for any type of economic construction as well. For any type of value creation, you need to have some type of intentionality. And, and I think the more this is being brought up and more uh, practices are being built and then people experience something here, something there, and they feel like, oh, this is possible. This is making me feel good. This is giving me insights. This is bringing points of reflections, like you mentioned earlier too, to have those quick iterations of like, what are some small mistakes and how can we reflect on those? And what is a way of improving like, how many families have that? How many people had that in their own construction as human beings of like, oh, what, what happened? How can I reflect on that? How can I improve? How can I um, include others? How can I be more um, accepting and generous and all of these things? So I think hopefully, I mean, hopefully we're working towards making that more obvious. That helps me a lot, actually. I mean, I realize uh, there is a third option, which is the answer is both. <laughs> Culture is complicated. So you need people with special training, with special skill sets, um, if you want it to, to happen in your organization in a healthy, exciting, complementary way to your rules. Uh, and it takes a lot of work, uh, which means that the, the people with those special skill sets need a lot of your organization's resources and kind of latitude in order to uh, intentional, uh, in order to succeed at executing their skill set and have it actually amount to something, I guess that's the worst case scenario in terms of a systematic accumulation of knowledge and b actually making it work. Also, you you mentioned now like having accumulating this systemic knowledge, and from a point you were bringing about the the Minecraft uh, example too, of like. Having so many people and in these digital spaces and having anons or, or, or people that have public identities or like all mixed together and having the data perspective, like being able to gather so many data about the systems gives this, um, it's like a combination of transparency with privacy because you can see everything that's happening. You don't necessarily have the people to point towards um, one thing or the other that happened either for bad or for good, but you have the perspective of the, how the system is moving according with the things that happen. So, so it seems like now we're gaining the superpower to be able to 
touch on just the parts of the system that need to be improved based on these loops that we're seeing and then change things from a systemic level and not from a personal level. So it's not a, yeah, it feels like it, it comes out of this like taking things personal from a blame type of perspective, like a punishment driven society to a more um, wholesome um, change, like being able to make changes in, in systemic levels. This is cool. You seem really in touch with the ways that technology and the online context are helping you on the culture building front. Um, I really want to hear more about that. Um, and along the way, I'd really like to hear um, uh, other aspects of your experience. I mean, it sounds like you developed a lot of your skills like in the offline realm uh, and in the process of transferring to a domain where there's anonymity. And there's really like a much broader spectrum of levels of engagement. Uh, there's a, the asynchronous nature of a lot of the communication. Um, uh, could, I, could I get your sense of how your kind of toolkit has adapted? There's some tools used more than you thought uh, or that you've even had to introduce. Other tools that you kind of just don't use very much at all uh, in adapting your old skills to, to this domain. I think there's one tool that I feel very bummed to not be using so much, which is the body. (laughs) I feel like that gives so much perspective into everything. Like, like see how people uh, behave in conferences. I always wanted to have like a, (laughs) a drone view of how everyone is so excited to be around each other because there's all this intimacy that is built with, uh, all of these other tools that we've been using. And and maybe there's something interesting about relations, relationships starting in, in a certain distance because I think there's uh, an incentive for honesty and especially with people being able to be anons, like you can, you can share what you're thinking and you can... Um, I don't know, take tasks to work on and uh, just be in places and you're somehow protected. And then this can build the trust level little by little. And then eventually like, oh, I'm opening my video today. Or I am like showing up at that conference and saying that I am who I am. Or um, I don't know, I've seen some of those happening and it's always like beautiful moments that you feel like people brighten up a little bit. So I, I hope at some point the body will come more into the game because there's so many other parts of us that as we're building this wholesome systems, uh, we'll, need to, um, we'll need to be brought in fully, like as our full expression. Even, I don't know, even talking about sexuality in a very safe space, even talking about um, like what what are other things that people are doing in their lives that are intersectional to the technology and having creative spaces, having residencies. I think more and more this will start happening, like bringing artists and and developers together and and seeing what are all the amazing things that can be created. Yeah, and mentioning kind of tools and earlier mentioning Discord bots, just because now I, uh, in my mind, Discord bots in Web3 communities are a layer of bureaucracy, limiting your ability to just go hound their community without needing to go through some basic checks. But it's an important one. And like, we're thinking of a Discord bot that was not meant to be a, a critical statement towards the bots. But um, it, it just makes me wonder when that's no longer just a pure text-based, fully automated thing that feels very impersonal, but when it's someone popping up in a full AR high quality 1080p definition right in front of you. And, you know, how, what is the nature of the true humanity that must always be present there? And the other elements that we've been missing out because our tech does not have a good way to like bring the kinesthetic to a digital interaction yet. And like, there's no ways to do that. I am still unclear of if I am more excited or more scared of how technology is going to change this. Is it really going to just make us, you know, like when we actually have, if we had the chance to be sitting in a single recording studio now, like, yes, you could feel the body language, you could feel the energy, there's just different things you can read off people. And 
is just being able to replicate that digitally enough to enhance something or is there always just something you know like something that our brain just fiends for that is fundamentally human that is part of this complexity and figuring out you know given the mission the kind of people you're bringing together and everything else you just have to find that secret sauce that will never be predefined for your community it's always going to be at that intersection of the specific goal of the specific people and of the specific tools and environments that you find yourself in i don't know if that was a question or just asking you to comment on my ramble but whatever you feel comfortable with there I mean, uh, that's the worst case scenario, and I think it's useful to go in assuming that. And if you end up finding lessons that transfer from another organization, you know, bonus points. Uh, if you end up finding, like, a magically talented person who's just made for it, you know, bonus points. But maybe it's a situation of assuming the worst, assuming you're in an everything affects everything kind of context with culture building and allow yourself to be the expert, allow yourself to tinker, and uh, and just have rule one being be intentional about it and reflective. Is that one rule? That's the one rule. Yeah. Seth, it sounds like you're coming from um, that you came from an, a non tech environment first, if I'm correct. That's right. Yeah, physical housing cooperatives. And you moved into the DAO space uh, or having more access to Web3 um, in, the, in, in this transition. So you've seen kind of like both words, worlds and, um, and both of them having this approach uh, on culture. What do you think the DAO space is missing the most from this like very grounded knowledge from cooperatives now? And what is your... What is your experience of bringing this forth? Like, how did you see this transition? I moved online not because I care about internet users necessarily or the internet necessarily. Really, I first moved to it because it's where all the data was at. It was the way to get, you know, we're coming from a time where the work of Ostrom, so our best known results from her are the uh, design principles for sustainable collective, uh, for sustainable resource, man common pool resource management. And that was like a 10 years of work, probably, or more, a meta-analysis of 300 ethnographies that themselves took, you know, years and decades to, to write. Uh, and, and through that huge comparative effort, she was able to distill out these sort of common principles across successful resource management institutions. I went online because in six months, I can get 300, I can get 3,000, I can get 300,000. And so it's just about scaling up uh, um, the data is absolutely the prereq to improving the quality of the general insights. Um, of course, once I get online, I see, whoa, wow, this really means th something to people. People are becoming better people online. So there does start to become something meaningful about looking at internet for internet's sake more than is just a, a data source. Now, what that means for, for DAOs and what DAOs are missing um, I can go two directions. I can um, either pretend or not pretend like I know what I'm talking about. Um, there's a lot to be said for pretending you know what you're talking about, but I think my kind of first orientation and my hat in this conversation is more on the first side. You know, I made it clear, I'm still surprised and impressed that anyone in crypto space cares about this stuff. And I'm only still putting together my mental model to appreciate that if within crypto people, you're a DAO person, if you know you self-selected into this sub subset, subspace of that larger space, then um, you've already got certain kind of values, commitments, ideology in place. Uh, and it still feels just so young and so early and the possibilities so um, you know, bafflingly uh, large that uh, I'm definitely much more in a position to, to learn from uh, what's going on here than to really be able to tell you all anything. And unfortunately, I realize our time is slowly going to be coming to an end here, but I wanted to transition from that note to kind of flipping it. And, and for both of you, whether it's uh, Livy in the context of Web3 or Seth more broadly in the context of uh, communities, whether offline or online, uh, and I guess really the broader context can be for both of you because it comes back down to just such a fundamentally human coordination uh, element to it. But 
what are you excited to see more experimentation towards or what, what kind of outcomes do you want to see people trying to shoot for when they are thinking about culture, right? If you're actually talking to someone, whether it's a researcher or someone whose job it is to build or be responsible for overseeing building, whatever you want to call it, culture at an organization, what are the kind of things you hope those folks are, are saying and keeping top of mind as they do their explorations or their building? Uh, for, for my part, um, you know, I've really emphasized how a lot of this work um, in your DAO, um, whoever you are, is going to be, um, you know, worst case, you on your own building it without a lot of general insights. And it's going to be a personal process. They can't benefit from systematic observation by a scientist. Um, but if that's ever going to be possible, there's a fair chance it's going to be possible in DAO space. If there's a standardized like technical backend, if a lot of DAOs are showing up basically with the same API in, so, in some sense at some level, uh, and their structure is putting the importance of culture into relief because of so much traditional effort that got put into maintaining organizational process has been automated, then you've got DAOs as a perfect laboratory for um, the kind of systematic observation that science is capable of. And it becomes the, the kind of thing that's suddenly amenable to um, the ideal perfect form, you know, the least bad possible form of knowledge building, which is scientific approaches. So my most exciting thing, I, you can tell I'm a scientist, is uh, DAOs as a laboratory for gaining insights into culture building in general that have never been possible through systematic observation in any other kind of human social system. That's my dream. I think what I would love to see um, happening more or more awareness coming into is just the health of individuals, just how uh, people have showing up, have been showing up to to these organizations, to these groups. And um, if we're thinking about systemic changes, really looking into the effects that the systems that we are transitioning out of, the systems that we are exiting from uh, have left in us. So what are, what are some of the behaviors that are still harmful that we are carrying within our mental models, within our behaviors, within our um, health practices, and how uh, this self-observation and the insights that uh, all data-driven processes bring to us, like defining metrics for health, uh, understanding like what are all of the places where you can get gather the data from yourself what is the awareness you have into the decisions you've been making uh, what are the decisions you can make like in your everyday environment and how they affect the way you interact with other people how they affect your awareness of class of uh social belonging in general and bringing these questionings to like a fresh start to these new systems of like how can we care more about the way we show up to each other and less about this very output oriented like massive production capitalist um, run that has been pervasing our our lives for so long yeah really Love the, the, the hopeful note to, to end us on there. I know for myself, yeah, it always comes back down to these are just but tools of exploration for the fundamental human questions. The tools themselves are frequently not the exciting part in the grand scheme of things. But yeah, I appreciate both of you taking the time to join. Uh, we will make sure to include any links on your work and the organizations you're affiliated with in the show notes. And we're just tremendously appreciative of you taking the time. So thank you both. Thanks, Eugene. Thank you, Eugene.